Too loud? <laughs> okay. So um, as we talked about at the beginning, uh, in the little flyer that came out, the title or, or the purpose of today's talk is to actually direct the discussion about the treatment for Parkinson's disease, but particularly about the middle stages and how you negotiate the drugs that you might choose um, for that. So um, I need to set the background first by getting some ideas of um, um, some terminology, and it's quite an important step in understanding how treatment works. So I might just turn the lights down a little bit. Too dark? Okay. Yeah. So if we imagine that um, at the time when Parkinson's symptoms first appear, it takes a little bit of time before someone turns up to the doctor, and that's when the uh, Parkinson's was diagnosed. And if there was no treatment available, say it was back in 1950, then the symptoms would get progressively worse over the years. But if we can add drugs, then for a period of time, the symptoms get back up so that there's nothing too much long and they hold it better than it would otherwise be for a period of time. Now we call these drugs symptom modifying drugs because that's what they're directed at, is making the symptoms go away. On the other hand, if we could actually look inside what was happening to the nervous system, by the time symptoms first appear, there's already been quite a lot of cell loss or changes inside the brain. And so they're progressing at a different rate to what the symptoms that are turning up. If we had a drug that could be then commenced that actually stopped the cell loss, then the cell loss, instead of going getting worse like that, it would be held steady here. And this is called a disease-modifying drug. So it's got an entirely different purpose. One is actually directed at stopping the symptoms, and the other one is directed at slowing the illness down so it stays where it is and doesn't get any worse. Now, unfortunately, at the present time, this is mostly what we've got for Parkinson's, and there's a debate around whether we have any at all of these ones. So at the beginning stage, I'm going to talk mostly about these disease symptom-modifying drugs, and we'll come back to the question of can we actually modify the disease at all. It's an important point to understand this because this comes to the heart of the question about when should you actually start drugs and why should you take them. And it always comes round to the point that it depends on how much the symptoms are troubling you. If you get to here and you're wanting to have a discussion about whether or not you should take the drugs, well, it all depends. It doesn't matter whether that worries the doctor or the doctor thinks you should be taking it. It really comes down to the question of are the symptoms troubling you? Now, one of the reasons that this is a hard question to answer is it depends on what you like doing. So if you are got a handicap at golf at 20 and you want to keep it there and that's the thing that worries you most, then you might end up taking medications earlier than if you're somebody who's really an avid gardener and the symptoms aren't really worrying you much at all. So it really comes down to this key question and it's important to be very honest with yourself and honest with others about whether the symptoms are a problem or not because that's what the drugs are aimed to fix. Nothing else. So I'm going to now spend a bit of time talking about the nature of the drugs that are available and how they work and therefore what we can expect of them. So between 1895 and 1968 it was discovered that the brain cells that were first affected to give symptoms were these ones at the base of the brain called in a region called the substantia nigra. That's why they give this black appearance here at the base of the brain. And in Parkinson's disease, they go missing. And this is the, a, a scan that lights up that area in the brain. And they're just down here. And they make their connections to this part of the brain. So the important finding was that in, back in two centuries ago was this part of the brain went missing. In 1958, these two people got the Nobel Prize for figuring out that the chemical in here was this chemical called dopamine, and that this drug, which we still use, called L-DOPA, actually led to replacement of dopamine in people with Parkinson's disease. And that's still the key drug that we talk about and use. 
Now it's worth actually spending a bit of time explaining the biology behind this because it'll help you understand what the choices are and how they work. If we could, that's where the nigral cells are and they send their connections up to this part of the brain. And if we could look closely with, and blow up this with a very large microscope, the nerve terminal looks something like this. And in the nerve terminal, the amino acid that we eat in our diet called tyrosine is turned into dopamine and it's stored in these little bags called vesicles. And as a signal comes down the nerve terminal, these bags float to the end of the terminal and empty their contents out into the space and they drift across to the other side where they bind with a receptor called the dopamine receptor and a signal is generated in the cell on the other side and it forms that communication in that way. And immediately that occurs, the cells, the dopamine sucked up in the cell, put in the little bag again for recycling and reuse when the next signal comes along. And that's a, a key message of what's called neurotransmission. And it's this process, which is the first thing that goes missing in Parkinson's because these terminals disappear and there's too little dopamine being made available for signaling. So L-DOPA, that's the one that the guys got the Nobel Prize for in the 50s. Its job is to replace dopamine and it does this, you recall that tyrosine, the, the amino acid in the food, is turned by this enzyme which we call TH, its name is tyrosine hydroxylase but to its friends we call it TH. And it's a slow enzyme and it goes about the business of making dopamine too slowly. L-DOPA comes in here, bypasses TH, the slow enzyme, and can rapidly make dopamine and fill up the little bags, the vesicles, more quickly and replace so the dopamine, so the nerve terminals that are still surviving in Parkinson's disease can now work harder than they would before. And that's the way L-DOPA works. So it predominantly works only in those parts of the terminals where there's already and affected, the brain is affected. So it doesn't work in anywhere else where dopamine is used, any other part of the brain, only in the part of the brain where there's already been nerve cell loss. And the drugs that use Matapar, these are the ones that you use, and many of you will be familiar with this, Matapar, Cinemet, and Kinson, are all different brand names for drugs that have L-DOPA in them. They are all slightly different. They have slightly different helper enzymes in them. But to all extents and differences, purposes, they're the same drug. And so often we use the example that they're a bit like Fords and Holdens. The aficionados can tell the difference, but most people can't really say what really is the, why would one be better than the other. Now there's another type of drug which has the rather unattractive name of D2 agonists. And what that means is that these drugs, instead of making more dopamine, they actually come right around the edge here and pretend to be dopamine and bind on the dopamine receptor, bypassing the whole business. And the most common one that we use here in Australia now is this one called Cifrol, or Premipexol is its name. We used to use a lot of cab cabasar or cabergoline, but uh, it's gone out of fashion because of its problems of causing fibrosis in the lung and the kidneys and on the heart. And there's a new one that's uh, being heavily marketed at present called rotigotine. And that um, is now been approved by the TGA, and, but it's not available on the PBS, you know, on the free list yet. Now, the advantage of the D2 agonists is that they act very smoothly, they last a long time, but the big disadvantage is that they work anywhere there's a dopamine receptor. So even if you've got perfectly good dopamine function somewhere else in the brain, they bypass that and still overstimulate, and so you can get overstimulation in parts of the brain where you don't want it. And we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. There's another class of drugs. So when this dopamine filters out out here, most of it gets taken up again for recycling and reuse. But some of it gets broken down and cleared and taken away and there are special enzymes available for that. One of them has, uh, we, we, we look for unattractive names in neurology, but so one is called the COMPT inhibitor uh, for uh, catechol-O-methyltransferase. Don't really worry too much, but that's the name of the drug is COMTAN. 
and Stilevo is another one that actually has the same process and Stilevo is a mixture of this Madapa and Comtan put in together. And there's another drug called Mayo, monoamine oxidase and these drugs inhibit it and there's a very old one called Selegiline which isn't used much but a new one that's just appearing on the market called Resagiline and um, that what you'll probably be hearing quite a lot more about it because there's a little bit of talk around whether that actually is one of these disease modifying drugs actually slows the illness down although the evidence is a bit soft about that. To most extents all of these drugs though are symptom modifying because they fix up dopamine transmission. So they restore dopamine back to where it was before and take away the symptoms that come about because of not enough dopamine. Now I'm going to come back to this a bit more but I just briefly want to talk about the pros and cons of these drugs. Now all of them because they lead to a little bit more, they can lead to a bit too much dopamine either in the brain or in the rest of the body can cause sleep disturbances they can lower the blood pressure and we're going to talk about what that problem is, leaving people feeling dizzy and lightheaded when they stand up. They can produce nausea, which is a, feels a, apparently, I've never had it, but a lot like uh, morning sickness. Um, and uh, it's uh, particularly true when people first start the drug. And it, all of them, every one of them can produce these abnormal involuntary movements called dyskinesia. So it's, um, there's a, a perception that L-DOPA produces that, but all of them can. Now the D2 agonists, that's the Pramipexol, Cifrol family, can, is more likely to produce these problems than the L-DOPA. That is that it's more likely to be an antidepressant, so that's a good tick for it but it can produce these impulse control problems and that's because it acts in other parts of the brain other than just where the dopamine is missing. And we can come back to talk about that in a bit more detail. But note, all of the drugs can cause that. They, all, they tend to be a bit more likely to produce anxiety and the other problem is that it's seldom sufficient to actually treat Parkinson's just by itself. It can do at the beginning stages but later on you need the help of drugs, other drugs. So that's the firepower we've got for treating Parkinson's disease. Now I'm going to talk about how we use it and when it's most helpful. Broadly speaking, there's three stages in Parkinson's disease and the effect of the drugs follows this line. They're best in the first few years, they're certainly very helpful here and they have waning effect at the later stages. And we can think of the effect of these, what happens in these uh, three stages like this. Initially, the first few years, first five or so years, is um, when you first start in medicine, you mainly see patients in this category because they're sent to you as new patients and you think it's pretty easy treating Parkinson's because everyone has effective response to treatment. There's few side effects and there's not, the patient's pretty happy with the way the drugs work, they work pretty well. And they're mainly directed at fixing the key initial symptoms of par Parkinson's, which is the slow movement and the stiffness and the immobility, and they have a little bit of effect on the tremor. But they're pretty good at doing that. Then the problem comes. In the second three years, the drugs still work, but they keep wearing off during the day. They only last, instead of lasting eight, ten hours and you didn't have to worry too much when you took them, it starts to matter actually when the time occurs and they start lasting five hours, four hours, three hours. As a result, there's fluctuations. During the day, people can go from being off, tablets not working, being slow, having the tremors, and then being pretty good or even having these dyskinesias or the involuntary movements as well. The drugs don't always work. They're, you can't rely on them. Sometimes you take them and nothing happens. Other times you take them and they work too well and so they become unreliable whereas over here it, it, it seemed like they were pretty good and you knew what they were going to do. People start to get these other problems of depression, sleep disturbance and a thing we call autonomic failure which is where 
the part of the nervous system that looks after the blood pressure, the bladder, the bowel, swallowing, all of those problems begin to appear. And again, I'll talk about that later on too. And these problems tend to be more of a heralding of this later stage where balance becomes a bigger and bigger problem and the drugs won't fix this and they're stopping to work even on fixing this stuff and we start to get side effects from the drugs which particularly can include hallucinations. So today I'm going to talk principally about those middle years and the first years. That's the real key issue I'm going to talk about today. The others are important but this is the main problem for today. And we can, because those dopamine drugs I talked about before, Madapar and the D2 agonists are our most important drugs, it's all about treating dopamine deficiency. And as the graph shows here, there's a good response and then it starts to decline. And at the same time, you start to get increasing features where it's, they're not due to the dopamine, they're due to other things. And if anything, the dopamine begins to cause problems. So we'll walk through these stages here, all of these problems one by one, starting here and then getting into here. So the big problem for the first three years is when to start the drugs and what to start with. So you recall that I said at the outset, when to start is when the symptoms are a problem. So that's a matter, what my experience in talking to people who have right at this stage, the decision usually falls into two categories. There are people who think, well, I don't really think there's too much wrong with me. And actually what they're really saying is, I don't want to say there's something too much wrong with me because I'm going to feel a bit bad about this. On the other hand, there are people who are worried a lot about, well, should I start? What difference would it make? And it's trying to find the balance between people who really don't need to start it because there really isn't anything wrong with them and people who don't want to start it, but really they ought to. And so between the doctor and the patient, you've got to have a pretty honest negotiation about when's the right time to do something about it. Another big problem that comes up is that there is an idea out there in internet land that L-dopa, the dopamine drugs, actually are bad for you. If you take them too soon, you use up all the goodness and you'll be punished in the end. Now that is absolutely wrong. There is no evidence at all to, to base that. And in fact, I can tell you where the evidence, where the story comes from. And it was due to some really quite disreputable research done in the late eighties um, and promulgated by a drug company, which now no longer is in existence, where they were pushing a particular drug that wasn't L-dopa and did some drug trials in which they compared high doses of L-dopa with their drug at a low dose. And of course, people got more side effects and more dyskinesia. But this idea has stuck on in the world that if you take L-dopa too soon, you're going to get dyskinesia earlier later on. Now, there isn't any evidence to support that. And if anything, there is evidence that might suggest that actually taking L-dopa soon slows the illness down a little bit. There was a very famous study done in 2004 in which 100 people with early diagnosed, newly diagnosed Parkinson's joined a study and they went for 12 months without taking a drug. Another 100 people who were identical in every other way commenced the drug L-dopa immediately and they went for 12 months, stopped the drug for a week and then they were examined in detail to compare the people who were on the drug who had been on the drug with those who didn't take it at all. The people who had, were on L-dopa actually were slightly better than those who didn't. And so there's all been all sorts of arguments and there's now a new trial coming back to ask the question, well, is L-dopa really slowing things down or was there, uh, that an artifact of the study? So I'm really saying that not to talk you into taking L-dopa because I don't think we know the evidence yet, but really to say, don't delay taking L-dopa because you fear that you're going to use up all the goodness at the beginning and be belted at the end. That's not true. It doesn't happen like that. The second point to make is that the reason that dyskinesia comes, this is these abnormal involuntary movements, is because it's the stage to which Parkinson's has got. So 
if we did this, if we were to try and do a rather cruel experiment, and there's reasons how this has come about, but let's just say we, we did it, in which we t said to one group of people, you can take drugs right at the beginning of your disease, and another group of people and said, you can't take drugs till you've had it for five years. We would find that the people who hadn't taken it for five years would be just as likely to have dyskinesia as those who had taken the drug for five years. It's the problem of how long the illness has been going, not whether you took L-dopa at the beginning. So I'm just really stressing here, you take the drug when you need it because of your symptoms and don't be fearful about taking it because there will be a retribution later on. Now the other drug that you could start with would be Cifrol, um, one of these D2 agonist drugs. Now one of the reasons that people think about using that first is there is also some literature which suggests that it too might delay rather than hasten the onset of the dyskinesia. Again the evidence is soft and so really from an evidence point of view we're not entirely sure which is the right one to take and I think you have to be really hard-nosed and say well not too much to be sure about either way and you actually canvass neurologists some recommend starting Cifrol some recommend starting L-dopa and I think nothing is wrong with either one from what we know at present. Well, they're very, this is a question of whether there's any pl studies planned to compare these things. And the difficulty is that um, what we really want to know is what would you be like, so if, let me explain this again. So if you're wanting to, I'll go back one more. The problem with the study about L-DOPA and the one, the one in 2004 was that you could really only work out whether in fact people had been protected, in other words the disease had been slowed down, by actually examining people off the drug. Now they waited one week and that was probably a mistake. They probably would have had to wait three weeks. Now that means that all of, some person who's actually been getting benefit of this drug has to go through the process of stopping the drug from three weeks and then being tested. Now the ethics departments don't like that study. It's also very expensive and you can understand that a lot of patients don't like the study either so it's hard to recruit. So that's why these studies are probably going to be a while before we can actually do them. So the other question is about delaying the time. Remember this is the time where you get the best dopamine response. If you put off till here before you take the drug you've wasted the honeymoon. There's, there's no, this doesn't wait for you, this is keeping on going whether or not you take the drug. So it's important to think hard as to whether in fact the symptoms are troubling you or not before you postpone taking the drug. So now I'm going to talk about the next stage, what happens here. Now the, the, the distinction between this stage and this one is actually characterized by the onset of this problem called wearing off. Now let's talk a little bit about what that is. So when in the first stage when, you, when someone first starts taking L-DOPA they can be quite cavalier about the timing and you can forget a dose and in fact you could probably forget two and nothing much would happen and that's because this is a cartoon of what happens when you take the drug. It builds up in the body and then wears off slowly over a period of time. And in the early stages of the disease, it might take about eight to 10 hours to wear off. But somewhere after about three to six years, the duration before it starts to wear off starts to get down to about four or five hours. Now this person's taking three doses a day and not noticing, it's not getting down too much to this threshold and so they're probably not noticing too much symptoms. But here around about six o'clock, they might be beginning to notice that the tremor's starting to come in or they're slowing down a bit or they're feeling a bit grey and woolly in the head. And so this, if this becomes worse, we call that wearing off of the drug. And if it were to progress, then you'd start to see progressive shortening and wearing off here. And another key thing you might find is that when you wake up in the morning, 
the symptoms are, are there to greet you because very often early in the stage of the disease people wake up and in the morning they're at their best because the dopamine's being restored in the sleep overnight when you're not using the neurons very much. But as, dopamine, as wearing off becomes more and more of a problem, this sleep benefit disappears and the symptoms are there to, wake up, to, to greet you in the morning and people find they're stiff and slow until they take their first tablet of the day and they often find they're uncomfortable when they wake up at night because they can't roll over, can't get comfortable and that's because of this wearing off problem. So how to fix that? Well there's a lot of things, you could, three things you can do. You can take the L-DOPA more frequent. You can look at this and say well it was wearing off at four hours with these troughs so just shove them up and make them more frequent so you go to five doses a day to try and solve that problem. Or you could take one of those enzyme blocking drugs like Comtan or Stilevo which would lengthen the duration of each dose by about 20%. So if you're wearing off after four hours, increasing it by 20% is pretty good. If you're wearing off only after two hours or one and a half hours, 20% is probably only about 30 minutes and not so valuable. The next thing you can do is to take a drug like, add on a drug like Cifrol, the D2 agonists, which smooth out underneath and they provide a flaw. So it means that when you wear off, there's still another drug underneath because Cifrol lasts 24 to 36 hours. So it's actually having a long, smooth benefit underneath. So when the wearing off comes, instead of there being a big trough, nothing there, it actually smooths out the bottom and makes it a lot less sharp and, and you don't have quite as much symptoms from it. Most people do, many neurologists have their choice about which of these ones is the better thing to do and my practice at least is to actually ask the patient which one they would prefer because sometimes taking four tablets a day is inconvenient, it's right in the middle of when you're doing something, you forget them and it might be easier to do one of these two things. So the next problem that happens at this time is this problem of dyskinesia. Now these are um, involuntary ab unwanted movements and actually what they are is um, the role of dopamine, we talked about this last time but those of you weren't there, the role of dopamine normally in the brain is to help us make movements automatically or make any behaviours automatic. So just to remind you, if you were learning to drive the car you're busy concentrating on steering wheel, clutch, gears, etc. Once you get proficient at that and once you can make it automatic, you can then start thinking about where you're going to drive the car and what you're going to do with it. Those movements that are made automatic, that needed dopamine to do and they're done as a habit. And there's many of those that, for example, the way I'm waving my hands around at present, uh, habits. That just happens to be the body language that I've learnt. And everyone has a set of extra movements that come about which are learnt and behavioural. When you get too much dopamine, a lot of those movements reappear. And they reappear in a way that you can't easily suppress them. They come out. So if you ask someone with this kinesia, stop it, they can hold it still for a little bit and then it starts to come out, particularly if you distract them and they come out automatically, which is the same as someone with a habit. If you ask them, don't make that habit, they're fine, but then as soon as they, as soon as they get into the swing of what they're talking about, the way the hand movements come out again habitually and they're unaware that they're doing it. And that's really the same what dyskinesia is. They're brought out by the excess dopamine, but they're constant. And the thing that sets them aside from habits is that they are out of context, inappropriate and hard to suppress. And they come at two main times. One is this what's called peak dose dyskinesia which is right in the middle of the dose, typically about an hour after the medications are taken and the way to treat that is to lower the dose. But if you lower the dose it's going to wear off sooner and you've got to take the next one more frequently. Or you have to have Pramipexol or Cifrol to smooth it out so that you can take a little of dose underneath. This is the most common one the other one is what's called biphasic and we don't know why this one happens but it occurs a little bit at the outset of the drug and then as the medication is wearing off at the end. Now one of the things that the, your neurologist will try and 
ask you about to try and sort these out is when you take the dose, when you take your medications, does it occur in the middle or is it occurring just as the next dose is due, which is when this occurs. The treatment for this one, lower the dose. The treatment for this one, increase the dose and make them more frequent. So you can see it's really important to try and understand the story and one of the ways you can help your neurologist is to try and understand what's dyskinesia and what's tremor, understand the difference between the two and pay a bit of attention as to how they occur and when the timing is because the management of the two types is different. One of the other and probably the biggest challenge with um, the problems with dyskinesia is when they are accompanied by fluctuations and unreliable response. And the reason that this becomes difficult is that you get to the stage where you can't get the benefit of the drug, that is taking away the slowness and the tremor, without getting the dyskinesia. They two seem to come together and there isn't a medicational middle ground. And the second thing is that the medications are unre unreliable as we talked about before. They don't always work and they don't always work on time. And this problem of swinging between being overtreated or dyskinetic and undertreated and fluctuating is uh, up and down, we call that fluctuations. And when you can't fix that by smoothing out the medications, that's when people start talking about these major interventions. And there's three available. Surgery or deep brain stimulation, apomorphine, and uh, more recently this uh, enteric l -dopa. and I'm just going to go through each of them separately now. Now all of them, you'll see I'm going to use the same thing as they're for use, use for, you use it for wearing off that can't be fixed by drugs. That's the time to use it. So you get to the stage where fiddling around with the drugs and modulating the drugs isn't going to fix it and that's time to have the DBS or an intervention, it could be whichever one suits you best. Now, surgery for DBS has a permanent benefit for dyskinesia. Dyskinesia goes away and it doesn't come back. So that's the good thing about it. It fixes dyskinesia up and does that really pretty well in most people. But it doesn't help freezing. And what I mean by freezing is this problem that if you're going through a tight spot like this, you're walking along and then you get stuck in the door and your feet won't work and, and you've got to have a cue to stop it over. When, and that's often confused as a fluctuation and its proper name is gait apraxia and that's not a good idea to have DBS for that. It won't fix that. And if that's the key problem, then surgery is not really the, the main game and in fact it might be a little bit late for surgery. Other times you shouldn't use it if there's neuropsychiatry and what we mean by that is if there's hallucinations beginning to emerge. And by hallucinations I don't mean dreams at night, I don't mean vivid dreams where you thrash out and um, hit your partner uh, while you're still asleep. What I'm talking about here is the appearance of people, usually people or sometimes objects in the room during waking time, typically around you know, five o'clock to nine o'clock at night. And when that's present, that's a very important reason why surgery shouldn't be considered. It also shouldn't be used if there's a significant decline in how well people are, are thinking and remembering. And now remember that in Parkinson's, that's not always about memory, but it can be about being uh, able to organize your day and think problems through, what we call executive function, the planning process. And if that's significantly impaired, that's also a reason why perhaps surgery isn't for you. And you shouldn't use it if your major problems are not dyskinesia or wearing off. In other words, if there's some other aspect of Parkinson's, then it's probably not really the right indication for using it. The other thing about surgery, and this is a key problem, is that probably should have put this picture in, so I'm going to go, here we are. All the things that I was saying not to use it for are really the beginning of this stage of the illness here. That's the problems with the hallucinations, the problem with the freezing and the problem with the balance, the problem with the cognitive decline. So there's a bit of a window. It's saying is once you've reached here, you might 
the window might have closed. So if you're going to have DBS, if it's going to happen at all, it's probably best to have it up here where you've got at least a few years to gain the benefit out of the risk. Now one of the problems is that the idea that you're going to let someone put an electrode in your brain while you're awake and thinking about it, it's a pretty daunting idea and so people want to put that off as long as possible. But just remember there's a risk to putting it off as long as possible. You might just not get as much value out of it as you really ought. So again, it's this key problem. You need to be very frank and look at it very carefully. If this is something you're going to do and the doctor suggests it, it's best to get on with it. But you're perfectly within your rights to say no thank you, but it's not very good logic to say, look, I'll put it off till I really need it because by that time it might be too late. Just remember there's a window and it doesn't wait for you. Has someone got all those things already? All which things? The These things. Cognitive impairment and yeah. the hallucinations. Yeah. Just think I don't know it's Parkinson's. Then it's probably not Parkinson's, it may be DLB or one of these other conditions. So it just depends on the story, but if it's very early in the Parkinsonian symptoms, it's, these are unusual for idiopathic Parkinson's for them to be there early on. Mm -hmm. So what are the options to DBS? Well, there's apomorphine. And again, same story. You use it for dyskinesia and wearing off that can't be fixed. So it's the same reason. It's, it's the same purpose. And whereas DBS isn't for people who've got neuropsychiatry and cognitive impairment, it might actually help a little bit. Now this is very early information, it's come out of a large group in a st study in the Netherlands, but it looks like it actually may help with some of these cognitive aspects of Parkinson's. So the other thing is that it's not, you can try it and see whether it works, and it's not nearly as uh, invasive or expensive, whereas DBS it's a big thing to try and find out whether you don't like it. It's not nearly as big a step to step use apomorphine and see whether it helps. The problem with apomorphine is that, and it's um, just to clarify for people, it's not addictive like morphine. It's got a, it, although its chemical structure is similar to morphine, it's not, we're not talking about that drug. It's not an opiate. It actually mimics dopamine. But it does require a daily injection. You have to inject a little butterfly needle under the skin each day and connect it up to the pump and the pump infuses it and you find a different bit of real estate to put it in each day. And it can produce nodules, itchy and um, sometimes painful nodules, hard nodules under the skin. And it requires good injection technique to minimise that. And the other problem is that it requires a, a bit of dexterity. And as you know, that's one of the things that's not in great supply with Parkinson's disease. And so that often means that the spouse has to have the dexterity. And the other thing is that Often people who've reached this stage of Parkinson's that require it also have punding. Now punding is the increased propensity to fiddle with gadgets and pull them apart and break them and not be able to put them together again and that constant fiddling with things. Now if you've got a gadget here and it just invites people playing with it and that can increase the injury that comes from it. So if there's a lot of punding that often can be a reason not to use it. Now the third treatment, which is in the same family and for the same reason, use it for dyskinesia and wearing off that can't be fixed, is to use uh, enteric L-DOPA. So it's the same drug, L-DOPA, the old friend, being done in exactly the same way. But at this stage, a little hole is made in the abdominal wall, straight through to the stomach, and the tube is placed into the stomach and then down into the duodenum and a gel is dribbled, dribbled, dribbled in by a pump constantly into the duodenum to be absorbed. Now the reason that this works better is for several reasons. The first is that it, um, L-DOPA only gets absorbed from about 30 centimetres just below the stomach. And because it's an amino acid that's uh, going in, then it's competed with by other food that's being eaten at the same time and so it doesn't get into the blood and across the brain as quickly if you've got anything else there. And the third problem is that the stomach slows down, and we're going to talk about this a bit in, in later, but the gut slows down in Parkinson's so 
the tablets don't as easily get out of the stomach into the duodenum and do what they're meant to do. And that's why the medications often become unreliable at this stage, why they sometimes don't work. So the infusion, the dribbling it into the duodenum, gets round many of these problems by just constantly supplying it and it smooths out these fluctuations. And recently there's a trial showing that this actually indeed works and that it's uh, helpful and um, effective. But it does require this tube to be put into the stomach, so it requires an operation, certainly not as big as having a deep brain stimulator. And there's less evidence that it actually helps with um, cognition and neuropsychiatry, but it probably isn't as bad at uh, causing cognitive changes as deep brain stimulation is. And um, again, because it requires a duod into the duodene and there's, um, the dose control requires some de dexterity in the same way as apomorphine and so you might need some help with that. And one of the biggest problems is that people keep fiddling with the tube and then it comes out and or goes up into the esophagus and then gets drug into the chest, into the lung and so that becomes a big problem, that's a contraindication again. So I'll just finish off on this note to emphasise again is that these are all significant steps but they have a place and if you're going to use them it's best to be clear that it's worth you getting on with using it but the balance is like everything else is the problem that you're fixing big enough to you to warrant having all of these other problems being done to you. There's not a medical reason for using it, it's actually is the, is the problem of sufficient gravity to you. So I'm just going down the list of these various things that happen in stage two. The next is depression and sleep disturbance. Now depression in Parkinson's disease is common and it's more common than in similar diseases with similar disability. So it's not because you've got a disability that you're alone that you're prone to get depression in Parkinson's. It's because the chemicals that are disturbed in depression are very similar to dopamine and the actions of dopamine. And so for that reason, people who weren't particularly prone to depression in previous life may be a little more prone to depression or significantly more prone to depression once they've got Parkinsonism. The second thing, reason that it occurs, and it's often associated with anxiety, is that when dopamine floods into the brain like it does with L-dopa, they get very high levels and washes out again, it's very similar to what happens with a number of the drugs of addiction. And so what, when someone gets a large dose of dopamine from a drug of addiction like cocaine, when the dopamine is wearing off, people get anxious and um, worried and fret and that's one of the reasons that drives them to look for a new dose of the drug. It's not as obvious that people run around looking for a hit with L-dopa, although that really can occur in some patients but that's unusual. What's really more the problem is that that sense as the medication is wearing off is that it produces a great a sense of anxiety and restlessness and dis-ease and that then leads to low mood. Mostly the depression that's associated with, with Parkinson's is not the deep, morbid depression that occurs as seen with young onset um, psychiatric problems, the depression of teenage years, but it's actually a low mood, apathy, difficult to engage, withdrawing from people around you, getting a bit grumpy, particularly in men, the cat's got to be careful that hides under the sofa, you know, there's just just um, really being flat and withdrawn is the much more common feature of depression in Parkinson's. So how to treat it? Well, one of the key things is to actually be aware that it could be there and that might actually be affecting you. And so often just understanding that that, that problem of withdrawing, um, feeling like no one really wants you and why would you come and talk to me and why, why should I go out and it's too much problem and in any way they won't want to have dinner with me and um, etc. That's really depression. Understanding that and then taking steps which is lifestyle things to put meaning back in what you do and engaging and making what you do worthwhile again is actually the most important part of getting better from depression and indeed from a getting it in the first place. So it's a key step 
early in Parkinson's is actually make sure that down the way you're going to have things which you think are worthwhile to do. And this is particularly a problem for people who get Parkinson's in their working life because we so often define ourselves and who we are by the work we do and then when you have to stop work because of Parkinson's then what are you going to do? And that's an important thing to think about is how you're going to manage that process and still keep value in what you do. It's absolutely possible but it's not going to happen unless you think hard about it. The other thing is this uh, cognitive behaviour, um, that's meant to be a T, not a D, cognitive behaviour therapy. Um, and this is a process of actually understanding, thinking about what drives your behaviour and psychologists are very good at helping you with that. And um, so if indeed you're one of these people who thinks that depression is becoming important, then um, it may be worth, worthwhile getting a spending some time with a psychologist to actually think about both how you change your lifestyle and how you recognise what are the drivers of your behaviour. It is sometimes necessary to use antidepressants and generally speaking we prefer to use the, the old-fashioned antidepressants rather than the new ones of the Prozac family and that's because there is a small risk that Prozac will, the Prozac type drugs, the SSRIs, might interfere a little bit with the Parkinson's. The second reason that we like NDEP or mirtazapine is that they're probably better for treating anxiety which is a key factor in the depression of Parkinson's and the third one is that NDEP in particular helps to restore sleep which often, its sleep disturbance is often one of the things that comes and makes depression a lot worse. And occasionally we need to treat the anxiety with a anti-anxiety anti drug and um, again, the view here is that if the anxiety is sufficiently disabling, then it is worth actually thinking about a drug to control it. It's different to someone who has um, anxiety outside of another disease. Sleep is the other problem that um, it often goes hand in hand with depression. And there's many reasons why sleep is disturbed in Parkinson's. Perhaps the um, most common is that um, there's a that people are a little bit uncomfortable particularly once wearing off starts because the drugs wear off at about three o'clock at night three o'clock in the morning you have to get up to go to the toilet the tremor comes back you're a bit uncomfortable and so that can be often addressed by either taking a long-acting drug like Cifrol so that it goes through the night or taking another dose of Cinemet or Matapar about the time that you get up to go to the toilet. Another reason that it occurs is because people are often very sleepy with Parkinson's disease during the daytime and particularly with the drug and so they're very tired so they go to bed at nine o'clock at night or even eight o'clock. Now it's worth remembering that the average 60 year old needs about uh, six hours of sleep even if you haven't got Parkinson's. Go to bed at nine o'clock, six o'clock is six hours is over by three. So that's a problem of normal sleep hygiene. So you need to be careful that if you are, you know, that you can't complain about waking up at three if you go to bed too early. So that's what we mean by sleep hygiene is it's reorganizing the sleeping pattern to fit and do what you want, how you, your sleeping pattern. Now I don't think there's anything wrong with being up at three if you want to, but um, probably there won't be many people to talk to. Um, the second problem is one of exercise and that is that as Parkinson slows you down it gets harder and harder to do exercise and exercise is an important component of keeping awake in the daytime. If you sleep a lot in the daytime you're going to sleep less at night. If you don't have enough exercise you'll also sleep poorly. So it's an, again an important thing to do when Parkinson's is first diagnosed to establish an exercise program that's sustainable throughout the duration of the disease. The other problem with um, sleep in Parkinson's is that it exaggerates the normal change that occurs with aging. So um, if you think about the normal profile of sleep patterns, little children will, um, when they're neonates, will sleep for four hours, wait for a couple, sleep for four, wait for a couple. As they become older, that's, um, the 
pattern becomes longer of uh, six to eight hours awake and 10 hours of sleep or so, something of that sort. And by the time you get to teenage and early 20s, people are capable of prodigious performance in both sleep and being awake. <laughs> but again, by, as one gets into your 60s and 70s, it's much more common for you to sleep for shorter periods and also need to, need to have a nap in the daytime. And this is exaggerated by Parkinson's so that sleepiness, made worse by the drugs, L-dopa in particular, and Cifrol both cause drowsiness and napping. And then this is associated with shorter periods of sleep and shorter periods of wakefulness. So again, one needs to think about how you're going to manage the night when you're not going to sleep as long as you otherwise would. Finally, the last reason that sleep is disturbed in Parkinson's is because um, Parkinson's itself causes what's called a rapid eye movement sleep disorder. That is when you go into the dreaming phase, normally our brain is disconnected from the rest of our body so that we don't get up and sleepwalk and do all of the heroic things we're dreaming about. In Parkinson's that disconnection becomes less clear cut so that people start to thrash out and actually live their dreams in the bedroom and many spouses will tell you about how they've worn the odd bruise or kick in the shins as the uh, people thrash out in the dreams. But the problem with this is that it disrupts this sleep stage and so the sleep is not as rewarding and not as restful as it would otherwise be. The, um, and so this problem of having these, the, the other reason one gets disturbance is that if you take Madapar, particularly Madapar Cinemet, but L-Dopa late at night, so after about seven or eight at night, there is a significant chance that it will increase uh, vivid dreams and particularly these breakthrough dreams of, um, that cause a bit of thrashing out. And so this again can cause disruption to sleep. We usually try and treat these um, rapid eye movement problems with either NDEP or clonazepam. It's probably the only way it can really be managed. So the last thing, nearly last thing I wanted to deal with, I'm just conscious that we're getting a little bit late, um, is autonomic function. Now, the main things we talk about here are constipation, bladder function, blood pressure, and sexual dysfunction. So constipation is, the reason it occurs, just briefly, is that um, the role of the small bowel is to mash the food up and get the goodness out. The role of the large bowel is to take fluid out so that it's not, uh, you don't lose too much fluid from your body. Now, the large bowel takes, the amount of fluid that it takes out really depends on the time that we have this term called transit time, the time that it takes to get from here to there. So if it takes longer, the stool will be harder and more difficult to pass. In Parkinson's disease, bowel function is slowed down like everything else is. So transit time is longer, more fluid is taken out, more chance of getting constipation. So we increase transit time or delay constipation by increasing bulk in the diet. That makes the bowel work harder on it and push it along its way quicker. Increase the fluid so it's got more to take out, so it's moister at the end. And exercise, for some reason, not really well known to anyone, exercise reduces constipation. Once it's there, then it's important to again use bulk forming drugs. These are readily available from the pharmacist and use the ones that increase bulk. So ask the pharmacist for bulk forming agents as well as bulk in your diet. If it's severe enough, you can use osmotic agents. These are things that draw water into the bowel and away from being drawn out of the bowel, which it's normally trying to do. Movacol is a good example of it and it works very well. In particular, don't use irritants. That just stimulates the bowel to move quickly for a bit and then it starts ignoring the irritant and thus becomes slower and slower. Very hard to treat, so stay away from them. And the other thing is um, the bowel's very slow in responding. If you start on a bulk diet, it'll take about a week before it gets better again. If you get constipation, um, allow constipation to occur, it takes about a week for it to settle in and then it takes about a week to cure it. So it's very, if, and if you just go and get a laxative and blast it out, then you're not going to be better the next day. You've got to wait and get the bulk aging and get onto it in a week later. So once you've got a pattern, stick to it and keep there and rather than just change it each day because 
you've got to really think about what you were like a week ago. Bladder function. Now again, one of the problems here is we've got to be aware of what happens just simply by having too many birthdays. What's normal is really that as one gets older, um, particularly with uh, either the effects of enlarging pl prostates or in the case of women, the problems of having children, then the bladder becomes less reliable and becomes more irritable and so the volume that you can hold and the length of time before you've got to get there becomes shorter. And that's got nothing to do with Parkinson's, just Parkinson's makes it worse. The second problem is that the bladder floor stability is controlled in part by dopamine. So when you haven't got dopamine there, the bladder floor becomes more unstable. So it, that means that it wants to empty its content very quickly once says it gets to a threshold. So at night, you're not taking as much dopamine, so the threshold comes a bit faster. You've got to get up more often to empty the, bowel, the, the bladder. And the third is that if you have low blood pressure in the daytime, then the kidney really works it on a head of pressure. If the pressure's down, it doesn't make as much urine. You lie down at night, the blood pressure goes up, then you make all that urine that you didn't get rid of during the daytime. So you've got to get up over the night to get rid of it. So all of these things can be controlled by doing what your mother said, that is drinking plenty in the morning and not drinking too much before you go to bed at night. Um, and um, perhaps taking drugs to act all night to help with the bladder floor instability. And um, the other problem which we've got down the bottom here is that to use these drugs which are bladder floor stabilizers like Vesicare which um, can help stabilize the bladder. But just be careful because in some people they cause confusion or sleep disturbance. The other problem is not that you've got to get up at night a lot but the problem of incontinence. And again, same factors up here cause this. Um, all the normal things like prostate and uh, uh, the problem of childbirth and also the menopause. Made worse if constipation is there. Always think about the question of whether there's infection. Don't always assume that, um, sorry, bladder floor instability we treat with Vesicare. And the other thing is just make sure you empty the bladder properly. And that often is that, uh, particularly men are a problem here, they usually try and empty their bladder standing up and dash in, dash out. Usually you should, if you're a man, sit down and take your time. And when you stand up, sit down again and do it again. Same with women. So do it twice. It empties it properly. If you don't, there's stuff left behind and that's what gets infected. And don't blame Parkinson's for everything. It could be bladder, could be bladder floor inst uh, prostate, could be bladder floor instability, all of those things that can normally affect um, bladder function. I'm just going to go quickly here because I'm conscious that we're getting too late. So blood pressure is an important factor. Normally when you're lying down the blood pressure is there and if you stand up the blood pressure would drop and the blood would run away from your head but there are reflexes that squeeze the blood up to the top there so that you stay upright and if those reflexes don't work we faint. That's what happens to soldiers on parade. Now the thing is that Parkinson's, Parkinson's drugs, diabetes, blood pressure drugs all block this reflex so that when you stand up the blood pressure doesn't come up as well as it should. And the symptoms of this are lightheadedness on standing and if it goes on bad enough you can become fuzzy headed and confused particularly at breakfast but also at other meal times. There can be lots more urine at night as we talked about before and there can be increased falls and blackouts. So it becomes quite an important thing particularly if in the later stages of these falls and blackouts. So what to do? You may need a 24 hour blood pressure monitor to confirm it. Drink fluid, particularly in the morning. Add salt and you may need to reduce or stop blood, pre blood pressure tablets but remember you will have high blood pressure when you're lying down but you're just getting low blood pressure when you stand up. When you, get, when you get an episode of lightheadedness, drink two glasses straight down. For some reason or other, it braces up the reflexes and makes it less likely to happen. When it happens, sit down. Don't try and struggle on. You'll fall over and break something serious, like an elbow or a, a hip. Mestanon is a drug that we can use for treating low blood pressure and quite effective. And sometimes we need to reduce the, blood pressure, the Parkinson's tablets because they often lower the blood pressure. So briefly I just want to talk about some things that you can do to help yourself. 
exercise. This is a pattern of life, so change it really early on when you've got the chance so that it becomes your lifelong activity and do things that you'll be going to be able to do for the duration of the disease. Try and reduce weight. If your balance is poor, it's a lot hard to be well balanced if you're carrying around more than you need to. Get your flu habit of drinking two litres a day, get that going right at the outset. But ask your doctor just in case you've got heart problems or other reasons why it wouldn't be good. And change your diet to avoid constipation. Avoid depression by thinking about you know, your life plan and how you do things and think about life activities, plan lifestyle and work. And I think it's important to avoid unproven st treatments that are either costly or in fact can do you harm. And whenever we do these things, we, everything in medicine, all the things I've talked about, any single thing, it's always this balance of harm versus benefit. And the only way we know the benefit is because someone's done some experimental trials to prove it. If they're not there, you don't know what the benefit is, so you've got to make sure the harm's not too bad. So I'm sorry to have rushed through that last little bit because I went on longer than I intended to. And uh, just again remind you about the Australian Parkinson's Disease Registry if you would like to participate in that. <coughs> so I know I've gone a long time. Some of you might be too tired to actually wait around. You're welcome to leave and I won't be uh, insulted. But if you want to ask me questions, I can do so for a few minutes. Yeah. So what, what is the uh, incidence of kidney damage from, from these drugs? There's no direct damage to the kidney from these drugs. Um, the reason that the kidney doesn't work so well is because when you're standing up and your blood pressure isn't so high, they're just not producing much urine, but there's no direct injury to the, to the kidney. Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's not necessarily the Parkinson's, that's because the nerves that control the muscles around the neck of the bladder have been injured. So um, usually they, or in many cases, they will grow back after a period of uh, somewhere between three and nine months. But if they haven't grown back after that time, there really isn't a lot that can be done about it, unfortunately. That's really because it, it depends on the nerves being intact and they've probably been damaged by the surgery. Right, sorry. Did you imply that the deep brain therapy has a deleterious effect on cognition? Uh, I meant to actually say it did. It wasn't just to imply it. So um, a number of people, again, it depends on where the surgery, what site of surgery, I don't mean the hospital, but the site in the brain that the surgery is done. So there's two main targets we have at present. Uh, one, you know, sort of just the, for the names, I'll tell you without going into detail. We'll go back to the microphone, sorry. Um, one is called the GPI and that's the older operation and that doesn't seem to have very much damage to cognition itself. The other one is called the STN which is the newer one that's done and a proportion and it's looking like a significant proportion of people become more impulsive and less able to their executive function is probably more affected. And that evidence is sort of still being debated and firming up now, but I think anecdotally everyone would agree that that's true. Looks like we're all done. You're released. <laughs>